Okay, save what you can to a memory stick and cover your tracks. I'll go run this by my editor. Talk soon. Sir, I just got off the phone with a source who's willing to go on the record with explosive stuff. I'm talking drugs, bribes, nepotism, insider trading. And it goes all the way to the top. Holy shit. Where's all this happening? Bozo's clown school? No. Strinelli's family circus? No. Not Crazy Carl's clown supplies? No, it's the Ministry of Transport. The clown ministry of transport? N no, I don't, I don't think that's a thing. <sighs> Take a seat. No, 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 don't. Just let it happen. Right. Good. Now, do I need to remind you what the name of our newspaper is? The Clown Times. The Clown Times. That's right. And what do we publish stories about? Clowns. And? Things that are interesting to clowns. Right. So when you bring me a story about corruption at the Ministry of Transport or whatever, I'm thinking, sure, okay, great. But why would a clown be interested in this? With all due respect, sir, this could be our Watergate. Everyone, clowns, non-clowns, are going to want to know their elected officials are having cocaine fueled orgies with taxpayer money. Uh, sir, we've got reports coming in of a big leak at the helium factory downtown. Hundreds of people walking around with high, squeaky voices. Sounds hilarious. Get down there, Sparkles. I want 500 words by tonight. Yep, you got it. See that? Now there's a clown story. These stories about taxpayer-funded, cocaine fueled orgies are... Oh, I don't know. I mean, was anybody there making balloon animals? Did anyone slip on a banana peel? No, my source didn't mention anything clown-related. Oh. But if I can be frank, I think this is bigger than that. Oh, come on. Look, I want to publish this story. I really do. But you know what it's like. I mean, we've done bits on politics and the environment before. It just... that stuff just doesn't fly. Unless we can find a way to make this interesting to the average clown in the street, the ones who actually buy our newspapers, then I just don't see how we can run it. My source may or may not have mentioned that the Minister for Transport was at one of these orgies. And he may have squeezed someone's bum and said, honk honk, like a tooty horn. That is good. Yeah. That's hilarious. No, it's really not the story. I reckon we roll with it. to get a new job. Telling people how the world works is tricky business, but someone's got to do it. Teaching, journalism, it's time to learn about education. The Citizen's Handbook The Citizen's In the first episode, we talked about getting into government to change New Zealand. But for better or worse, this is a democracy, and ultimately the government can only do what we want them to do. So who makes sure the public understands our country, and who tells the public what problems need fixing? No, it's not adorable web series hosts, it's teachers, you know, from detention. Now, if you're being forced to watch this in social studies by a teacher who just put on a video and is now flicking through a magazine and chewing some gum, then you might think, are you sure these people are an important part of systemic change? But surprisingly, the answer is yes. Without parents helping their children to understand the world and to play and to question and to love learning, we would have an uncritical society and things would never improve. Without teachers, students would never learn to read and write, to codify their ideas and to build on the knowledge of their predecessors and question and create new knowledge, and then where would we be? The Dark Ages? Do you want to go back to the Dark Ages? Is that what you want? Okay, come on, just, can we turn out the lights? Look. It's all spooky now. Is that what you want? Okay, can we get the light, the light back on, please? Hope you've all learned a valuable lesson.
But education isn't just for children. Teachers for adults are called journalists. And as you might expect, adults are harder to teach. They're stressed with jobs and bills, and they're no longer legally required to go to school. So it's hard to get them to read your boring educational material when they could be reading conspiracy theories on Facebook or watching hot people dance on TikTok. But being a journalist can still be very important. Story time. Once upon a time in the 1970s, there was a national women's hospital called the National Women's Hospital. And there was a man who worked there called Dr. Herbert Green, who thought he was right about everything. And he was like, hey everyone, I've got this theory about carcinoma in situ, which is that it doesn't develop into cancer. And I'm going to prove my theory in a really cool and safe way. I'm just not going to treat some women. And if they don't get cancer, everyone will know I'm right. And if I'm wrong, they'll die. And I won't ask for their permission or tell them what I'm doing, and I think that's fine, because I'm Dr. Herbert Green. Bye! And some other doctors at the hospital were like, hmm, that seems batshit and not okay at all, so we're going to write a journal article that says, hey, lots of people are dying at this hospital, so that's pretty bad. And they waited for the article to come out, and then it did come out, and nobody cared, and that's the end of the story. But then, two women named Sandra Coney and Phyllida Bunkle found the article and they were like, this is really bad. We should talk to some of the women who went through this and write an article about it and tell the world. And no offense to the doctors who wrote their article in a science journal, but we're going to publish our story in Metro Magazine. And it's going to be like a thousand times more interesting to read. Cool, huh? So they did. And people were like, what? He was doing what at that hospital? And there was a big inquiry and the rules were changed so that you had to get your tests approved in public by government officials. And you can't just do whatever you want at your hospital because you think you're so smart. The end. Phyllida Bunkle and Sandra Coney were given time to develop a story that was in the public interest. And then they told that story and things got better. But it's not always like that. And throughout history, journalism has often sucked really, really bad. Newspapers that still exist today were busy in the 1800s calling Māori who supported the colonisers friendly natives, while the Nelson Evening Mail called Māori who opposed colonisation truculent savages. Although, of course, the Nelson Evening Mail has changed a lot since then. They're now just called the Nelson Mail. And in 1920, they merged with another newspaper called The Colonist. And that racism has hardly gone away. In the early 2000s, this bias came up again when media discussed government ownership of the foreshore and seabed. And people started saying it was about New Zealanders' access to the beach. As though Māori people weren't New Zealanders. These days, media organisations have newsrooms that are more independent and aren't just newsletters put out by the New Zealand company to justify all the colonising. But whether you're a private or a public organisation, you do have to find some way to get your work in front of people. And that can create a bias towards provocative headlines and telling people what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. But even more but! Despite all that, you still might be determined to teach stuff to grown-ups. And that's good, because the industry needs more people like you who are tenacious, empathetic, and critical of authority apart from me. Okay, I'm a good authority. Don't criticize me, I'm very fragile. If journalism sounds like the gig for you, then we're here to help. We spoke to some clever journalists and found out how to get the gig. First, consume lots of good quality journalism. Second, you can get a journalism degree and that'll help you get an internship, but you don't have to. It's often more useful to have a good understanding of a specialist area that other journalists won't understand, so you can write stuff that they can't. Third, some organizations hire cadets straight out of high school, and a lot of them have relationships with student magazines and radio stations, so you can go work at those. Fourth, move to a city where journalism gets written. Join Twitter, DM journalists, and they will meet you for a coffee. They'll be impressed you took the initiative, and they all have big egos and want to tell you about how cool they are. If you want to go it alone and be a citizen journalist, then you can. But as with all shortcuts, I would only advise it if you're extremely rich. Newspapers and other media organizations pull resources. They have cash money, so they can pay your legal fees when you get sued for defamation. They can take people to court on your behalf to challenge suppression orders. They can fund months of research so you can do stories that matter. A lot of people hate politicians and lawyers, teachers and journalists, and some of them do suck. But that's true of every profession. See? We only pay attention to the people that suck in these jobs because they matter. 
They're important. They're paid to shape society. And you could be one of them. Or you could work outside the system and pressure them to change. Well, that sounds exciting. Could that be the topic of the next episode? Maybe. Guess you'll have to watch to find out. Exciting. See you then.